want to know um, who the shoppers are in the room. So if you go shopping and you're buying a litre of milk, how much does a litre of milk typically cost? Uh, my wife. <laughs> oh, no, not me. <laughs> you delegate. <laughs> Some of you must have bought a litre of milk. Pardon? Sure. No, I never buy an individual item. I'm always buying with a whole bunch of stuff, so I never pay any attention. David, 89 pence. I've got no idea. One pound uh, 29. Pounds is about right. We go to a local farm and buy it. So one pound 29. <laughs> Oh, I would, yeah. one pound twenty-nine. Uh, and we're just thinking about this. Nice. Yesterday, so. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> around about a pound. But okay. but the fact that so many people are saying, "Oh, I don't, I'm not really sure," or it's it's just in the basket. I think there's a pricing lesson there, straight away, isn't there? You know. Mm. So, uh, wine drinkers, if you were buying a fairly nice bottle of wine for yourself, uh, what would that cost? How much is? What would you spend on the bottle of wine? On a nice one, uh, a, a re yeah. relatively. Uh, a tenner. Yeah, I, I, that's me too. Um, if I'm going down to Majestic to buy some wine for myself, it'll be somewhere sort of between eight and twelve pounds. Yeah, so about a tenner. Any whiskey drinkers? This is a twelve-year-old Bolveni single malt Scotch whiskey. God. What would you pay for that in the shops? Uh, well, because it's Scottish, I, I know they're they're very keen on saving money, but they're also very keen on taking other people's. So I imagine <laughs> it's very dear. Uh, I would say for a single malt, you're going to be talking about 30 quid or something? 40, maybe. Yeah. yeah. It's about 40. 30, yeah. I think it was 38 pounds and change. So about 40 pounds. <laughs> so there's three liquids that you'll find in the average home. What would you say is the most expensive liquid that you'll find in an average home if you were to buy by the litre? Red Bull. Yeah. It should be expensive. It gives you wings, but it's not as expensive as this. Uh, Print, printers, ink, printers ink, printers ink, printing ink. No. Oh, uh, printer ink. Yeah. 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 So <laughs> if if you were to buy the content of that well, a whole litre in one go, how much do you think it would cost? As in pound. That's not bad. £2,150. So the question then is, what makes this not 10% or 20% more expensive than a lovingly handcrafted 12-year-old single malt Scotch whiskey, but 50 times more expensive? And the answer is nothing. There's no law of the universe that says that's got to be one price and the, the whiskey's got to be another price. The price that we're prepared to pay for anything depends upon a whole bunch of psychological factors and that's what we're going to explore today the psychology behind how we make a pricing decision so we're just going to cover a little bit more on on the background to this and then what i'm going to do is i'm going to take you through three concepts that apply this psychology in the way that you present your prices and if you follow the methods that i'll be showing you you should be able to make higher prices stickier you're more likely to get a higher price. So that's what we want to do today. Let's kick off and uh, just have a look at the slides then. So this is, there we go. Uh, this is how to price your platypus. Uh, this is all about pricing. Um, when, we, when we do you know, these mental shortcuts that we use to take a, a decision about, is this a fair price or is that not a fair price? These, all of these mental shortcuts, psychologists have a name for them. They call them heuristics. Heuristics is just a really posh word for rules of thumb. And this is what makes us human. If, if we were computers, uh, we might analyze every single situation that, that's presented in front of us. But we're not, you know. Um, we, we need to get on with life. And our subconscious, what uh, we call our subconscious psychologists call a system one brain is making decisions continuously like this all of the time uh, and it makes those decisions and it presents those decisions to our conscious mind what psychologists call our system two mind which is a bit lazy and goes great I don't have to do any work I'll just rationalize why that was the right decision all along and there are hundreds uh, at least a couple of hundred of these 
these mental shortcuts, these cognitive biases, these rules of thumb that have been identified. And this is how we make the vast majority of our decisions. Inside our heads, it feels like we are completely logical, where everything is considered and thought through. And in reality, every time anything is tested, we're very emotional in how we make decisions. Now, you might be thinking, OK, that's all very well. And if I was selling to consumers, I understand why that might be important. But I, I actually sell to other businesses. And we, we don't like to think that exactly. um, uh, the businesses uh, are rational. You know? uh, sorry. Uh, can, uh, uh, guys, if, if you can go on mute, I think there's a bit of background noise at the moment. Um, so probably we, we all like to think that uh, uh, the businesses are rational. Uh, they're not like ordinary consumers. But that's not necessarily the case. You know, my own experience, uh, I was group marketing director for a company that manufactured hospital beds. We'd receive a tender, 200 hospital beds for award. You know, So we'd, uh, we'd open it up, we'd go through to the specification, and it would be absolutely clear from the specification who they wanted as their preferred supplier. It's fabulous if it's us, miserable if it's the competition. Now, when the hospital is buying hospital beds, there's a, a room full of people involved in the this decision. You've got nurses and the sisters on the ward, somebody from manual handlings, somebody from infection control, and that's kind of topical right now. Engineering, asset management, finance, room full of people. They have a list of criteria. Those criteria are weighted. They score our response against those criteria. And whoever gets the highest score should win the bid. And yet it's absolutely clear that even before they start the process, they have already decided who it is that they want to work with. Now, I was talking to an audience up in the Northeast and a guy stuck his hand up and said, I've got an even better example than that. He had an opportunity to deliver a sales training package to a global organization. So he got the spec, went to town, nailed it. Came up with a superb sales training solution for them. Then he got Google out and he found every location around the globe where they had a sales office and he found an associate who could deliver the same package to the same standards. So I put all of this together, sent it in, got through the first round, the second round, got all the way down to the last two and he lost it. They got on the phone to find out why and they, they said, well, look, you, you're good. You, you, were, you were very, very good. But, but the, the, there's this consultant that we work with and he's, he's not a sales trader, but he says he can do a good job and, and we know him and he knows us, so we thought we'd give him a go. They did not lose it because of competence or quality. They did not lose it because of price. They lost it because of chemistry, an existing relationship, trust that was already in place. This just illustrates that not all business decisions are based on just the facts in front of people. I want to illustrate this a bit further. So, um, I want you all to imagine that you're judges. I'm going to come off screen share so I can see you. So I want you all to imagine that you are judges. Uh, I'm in jail uh, and I'm in front of you seeking parole. So you're going to decide whether you're going to let me out or not. So if you were a judge, what kind of criteria would you be looking for in order to make that decision? What kind of things would you be considering? What, what you've done? What your behaviour yeah. being, your behaviour. Yep, uh, so severity of the crime, or have I been a good boy and kept my nose clean while I've been inside? Absolutely, you know, two really good ideas. Anything oh, yeah. else? Contrition. Yeah, I, I, am I sorry for the crime? Do I want to make amends? Yeah. <coughs> what else do you think? The, the way you look. Yeah, <laughs> look, hey, uh, <laughs> I've gone to town. I, I, I grew up in Liverpool, you know, so, uh, so I'm a, uh, used to talk like this back at school. So I've, I've really, I've got, I've got the white shell suit on today. I'm really trying to impress, you know. So, yeah, you know, how, uh, how smart you are. Let me show you some research. This is uh, 1,100 parole cases were analysed. And it turned out there was a weak correlation with two factors. 
And the first one was the number of previous offences. So am I just a serial offender? You're going to let me out, revolving door, three days later, I'll be straight back in the game. And the second one was, the, is there a scheme to help me go straight? A rehabilitation programme I can participate in. Now, I emphasise that was a weak correlation with those two factors. By far and away, the strongest correlation was this. What you're looking at is a graph where the vertical axis is the percentage of time that the judges say yes. The horizontal axis is time. So first thing in the morning, judges are saying yes, 65% of the time. That declines down to about zero by the mid-morning break. They have a break, they come back. They're saying yes, 65% of the time. Again, that declines down to about 10% at lunchtime. They have a break and they come back. They're saying yes, 65% of the time again, and that declines down to zero by the end of the day. So the single fact that had the biggest influence on whether judges said yes or no to parole was how recently they'd had a break. Now, the paper speculates about its blood sugar levels or something like that, and you can't tell that from the data. All you can tell is the behavior. Me personally, I imagine, you know, you're a judge, you drive in, it's a beautiful world, the birds are singing in the trees, you're full of the joys of life. Um, by the time you've heard the 19th identical sob story, you're just probably getting a little bit cynical about it all, and you need to mentally reset. It might be as simple as that. Well, all I'm saying here is, though, that it's a non-objective factor that is influencing the judge. And these are not the only ones. This is not the only research into judicial decisions. It turns out that if you give the same case to a different judge, you can get a different outcome. Well, different people, different opinions. The same case to the same judge, but on a different day, you can get a different outcome. Judges with daughters tend to be more lenient than judges without. Judges don't like to be lenient too many times on the trot. Or the one that really worried me, judges whose sports teams lost the night before tend to be less lenient the day after. Can you imagine the carnage last June in the English courts after you <laughs> lost on penalties yet again? You know? um, but these are non-objective factors. In David, business, uh, David sorry, sorry to interrupt. Was it a question? Yeah, Sharan makes a very, very good point and, and relevant yeah. to the group. Um, there's some very similar stats on VCs approving funding, highest yeah. approvals in the morning, um, and after lunch, before lunch, the most declines. And I, I reckon there's some um, shared stuff. I'm going to look that one up. That's excellent. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. In fact, uh, uh, if you've got um, if you've got a reference, yeah, I'll, I'll dig it out. I can't remember where I read it. I'll dig it out. Send it to Sharon. Yeah, that that's superb. Um, I, and it just illustrates hell. You only have to open the business pages in the press. You now the number of acquisitions that go wrong, and you've got really intelligent people, you know, involved on both sides and. And the, the acquiring company will have teams of, of what, have, and yet the number of acquisitions where somebody buys something and it turns out they've massively overpaid. And it's because egos get in the way and it's not rational anymore. And, and if at the very highest echelons of business, RBS buying whatever it was called, AIM or uh, something, um, if mistakes like that could be made at that level because it's all ego driven and emotionally driven, then the people that we deal with one-on-one, -on -one, the professional buyers or the owners of businesses that we're selling to, you know, there's ego and emotion and non-rational decisions in there as well. And compared to judges, you know, judges are meant to have, you know, have decades of experience. They're meant to look at nothing but the objective facts in front of them. If they are influenced by these non-objective factors, then we all are. Um, and that's the core point. So that leads me on to, you know, how do we apply all of this? Well, um, this is all about pricing. This is what a pricing process actually looks like. You start off by understanding the basic approach to pricing that the organization takes. There's a chunk of analysis to understand where my profit comes from and what value looks like from the, the point of view of the customer. All of that, field, um, uh, all of that leads into uh, what fundamental pricing strategy are you going to adopt? 
And then that goes into, okay, there are tactical things we can do with pricing, and then there are ways to communicate our price. We're just concentrating today in that last little box. So there's a huge field to pricing, but we're just going to look at that one little bit. How can we communicate a price to make a higher price stickier? <coughs> Excuse me. And before we do get into the first of the pricing concepts, I just want to introduce you to my little friend. The, it's called How to Price Your Platypus. This is my platypus. And as you can see, he's not a real platypus. He's actually a metaphor. He's a metaphor for all the pricing challenges that we face in business, because pricing usually is a challenge. Nobody wants to go in too cheap and leave money on the table or be too expensive and lose a sale. It's, you know, and particularly in B2B, where the competition's prices are not necessarily evident. You know, they're not published uh, very often. It can be very, very difficult to know exactly where you're going to pitch yourself. Uh, and I, I use the platypus as a, as a metaphor because if I came to any one of you and said, here's a real life two-year-old male platypus, sell him for the maximum amount of money that you can get, where would you start? I've, you can't Google it. I've tried. There's no market for platypuses. It would be a challenge. So he's my metaphor, but I'm also going to apply, uh, apply the three pricing principles to my little friend while I'm selling him to you. Let's get into the first of the pricing concepts. So this is number one, it's about price anchors. So what's a price anchor? It's a number that you have in your head that represents what you think the value for something should be, or the price of something should be. For example, I, I live in God's own county. I live in Yorkshire. Um, if I go down to London and I look in the estate agent windows down in London, I struggle to imagine how anybody down there can afford a one up, one down dog kennel to live in, you know. Whereas I imagine somebody from London who comes up to Bradford and looks in our estate agent windows, they probably think that we're living in gated communities with a different house for every day of the week because we're giving them away cheap as chips. We've each got an anchor in our head. The point about anchors, though, is they can be temporary and arbitrary. So a group of people. Uh, were asked to bid on six different items. Doesn't matter what the items were. The point about this, though, is it was a blind auction that they were participating in. So none of them knew what anybody else would, would bid. They're going to write down their bids on a piece of paper, hand it in. They can't see anybody else's paper. The last thing that they were asked to do before they wrote down their bids was to write down the last two digits of their national insurance number a completely random number in the top corner of the paper. And what happened was this. Those people whose digits were in the 0 to 19 range, they bid a range of prices from about nine-ish to 16 pounds, something like that. Those in the 20 to 39 range, they were bidding 10 up to 27. Those in the 80 to 99 range, they were bidding about 20 up to 56. Just the act of writing down a completely random number in the top corner of the paper influenced how much they were prepared to pay. Now, this just sounds mad, sounds ridiculous. Nobody's like that, are they? Well, about seven years ago, BBC Horizon had a programme called How You Really Make Decisions. It featured the work of a guy called Daniel Kahneman and another one called Amos Tversky, who sadly passed away. Kahneman got a Nobel Prize for this, uh, but they're not awarded posthumously, so Tversky never got one. Really incredible stuff. The, those two psychologists, they did a huge amount of work after the war, laying the foundations for how we understand decisions are made. They had a guy walking along a riverbank, holding a bottle of champagne and a bag of ping pong balls. And he'd go up to people and say, I've got a bag of balls here numbered one to 100. 100 balls written one to 100 on them. Can you pull a ball out of the bag, please, and tell me what the number is on it? And they'd pull a ball out and they'd say it's a 10. So they'd say, OK, well, the bottle of champagne, it's a genuine vintage 2009, whatever, genuine vintage bottle of champagne. Would you be prepared to pay 10 pounds for this, yes or no? So they'd say yes or no. And then he'd ask them, well, what's the maximum amount of money that you'd be prepared to pay? If you're ever involved in any kind of psychology experiment of any kind, 
there's usually a fib going on somewhere. And in this case, the fib was he had two bags of balls. One bag was every single ball in the bag was number 10. The other bag, every single ball in the bag was numbered 65. The people who pulled the ball out of the 10 bag, the range of prices that they were prepared to pay for the bottle of champagne was about seven to 10 pounds. One person said, well, maybe 20. The people who pulled the ball out of the 65 bag, their range of prices were about 40 to 60. One young lady said, oh, 50 to 80. Just the act of pulling a completely random ball out of a bag influenced how much money they were prepared to pay. This is the power of anchors. So how do we use this? Well, um, as an international pricing speaker, I get to all of the fabulous locations around the world, including the flooring show in Harrogate, where I was talking to retailers about how they might improve their prices. And if you, if you ever buy carpet, you'll, you'll go into the shop, you choose the carpet, and then you've got to choose an underlay to go beneath it. And you'll pre be presented with something like this. And it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? You write from left to right, you count up. This is the natural way that we would present any information. And I said to the audience, what happens if you just swap the, those numbers around? At the end of the session, this guy came up to me, said, my name's Mr. Patel. I own Patel Carpets. I did exactly that a year ago. Before he changed it around, the most popular underlay that he sold was the 499. Because people anchor on the 299. It, it's a bit thin, but oh, oh feel a software, a softwork. That's so much better. And it's only two pounds a square meter more. He swapped the order around and people anchored on the, the system 10. Oh, feel the luxury. That's so, oh, but it's a bit expensive. But, oh, the colour's red. It's just as good. And we save two pounds a square metre. People anchor on the first item that they see, and that becomes the reference point that everything else is then compared against. I took my wife out to uh, for her birthday a couple of years ago up in New, uh, Newcastle place called Blackfriars. If you're ever up in Newcastle, fabulous place. And they came along with the menu and they put the menu down. And, and I got un unreasonably giddy with the family and I say to the family, look at the menu, you know, well, what's special about it? And saying that there's no pencil. Say, no, 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 it's not that. I'll blow it up for you so you can see it. Look at the prices of the, um, uh, the starters. They're in descending price order. So are the main. So they, everything there on the menu is in descending price order. I've spoken to Vistage audiences in the past where there've been um, restaurateurs in the, uh, the audience. And typically when you go into a restaurant and you look at the wine list, it starts with the house white and red at the top and goes all the way down to the chateau, whatever at the bottom. Uh, or they, they've gone in the next day and they've just reversed the order of their menu and the average price of the wine that they sell has increased. As simple as that. So how do we use this? Well, most businesses, when they're quoting for something, just put one price in front of the customer. But you know more about the customer than they do because you sell what you do many, many times over to many different people and they're buying it just once. So you want to be able to present uh, things that they might not have thought about. So, for example, uh, this, this is... Uh, executive service, service is a real company. This is not one of their, um, uh, their quotes. This is an imaginary quote that, that I've created just for illustration uh, purposes. Uh, yeah. But um, you know, if you're in recruitment, um, sure, somebody wants you to recruit their new CEO, so you can, you can charge for that. The, um, uh, you know, it's, you know, whatever is an appropriate amount of money, you know, it'll be some, some proportion of the, uh, the starting salary or whatever. Um, but, you know, our experience is, is that you'll make a better decision if instead of us just giving you a short list of CVs and you interview them, if we help manage an assessment day, you'll get, you'll make a better decision. And you'll, you know, and our data is that you're 20% more likely to get the very best candidate. And we'll charge you 27,000 for that. But we also find that if there's a real quality onboarding process, then they're, they're up and running a quote, you know, 
three months faster than they would otherwise be. And you're getting all the benefit of the, you know, and we, we can charge for that too. So here's three options for you. But if we're going to create anchors, then what we would do, of course, is put them, oops, uh, put them in highest price first order. Because our natural inclination would be to start like this. Oh, here's the thing that you quoted for and, and, and going up in price. But all we have to do is turn it round so that we start with the highest priced item first. Or another example might be um, a, an IT uh, company. Sure, we can come in and we can do the full cyber security solution for you. and We can put all of that in place. Uh, but as well as that, we can uh, ensure that you've got disaster recovery because you didn't mention that. Uh, and our experience is that that's pretty damned important. And once a year, we'll come along, we'll challenge, you know, we'll, we'll do a test to see how vulnerable you are, including all the human elements. If we send a phishing email, how many people open the attachment? Yeah. So we can do all of that for you too. But we present it in descending price order. Now, they're, they're two service uh, organizations. You can do this with, pro uh, with products as well. One example is on websites. Yeah, so this is a this is a real website, uh, and as you can see, you know the um, uh, if we if we zoom in so that you can see a little bit more, the, the it's a relatively random number uh, uh, way of sorting 118, 140, 174, 134, whatever. What happens if what we do is we just move everything around so it's in descending price order? 196, 174, 174, 138, 134. Now, you might think, okay, the, that's all very well, but the problem is we've actually got quite a lot of products and they go from about a five or up to 500 pounds. And that, that will be the case with this, this company too. You know, So uh, if we just did a price high to low, you're actually starting off with a 700 pound uh, toilet all the way down to the, you know, whatever it was, 50 quid or for the, uh, the absolute cheapest. Nobody will ever get down to the bottom one. But what you can do then is you can put in some hero products. Here's our most popular products. There's the Trade Doc M Pack LL, whatever that is, for 487. There's the 605. There's the 335. And then you've got your default sort order, 118, 114, 174. And these now look cheap by comparison, because you've anchored on the our most popular products, our favorite products, people who look at these normally, but whatever you want to call it, you know, we put those anchors up at the, at the top with the hero products. So you can do this with products as well. Uh, and I can do it with my little friend, uh, you know, so um, it's 30 pound for my superb 15 inch uh, platypus, uh, 20 pound for the inferior nine inch, £10 for the entry-level platypus, and <laughs> don't you like the concept of an entry-level platypus? Or I'll give him a model number, the platypus 50. It could be your credentials. It could... Anchors can be anything, you know, any numbers that the people anchor on, and then they see the price. Second concept that I want to introduce you to is this, something called the power of zero. What happens when we encounter free? A group of researchers went into a shopping mall in the States and they offer people two chocolates. There was a luxury lint, which normally retails for a dollar and they were offering it for 15 cents or a Hershey's kiss. And actually, I've got to ask you a question. Uh, give me a wave if you've ever eaten a Hershey's kiss. Yeah. How would you describe it? Small. Just a bit like <laughs> So that is that's the most common word that I've you know, I, in, in almost anything to do with any research. There's never 100 percent of anything except 100 percent of everybody in the UK that I've ever asked about this. I said, yeah, it tastes like sick. You know, so not very pleasant as a chocolate. The milk, so yes. a Sorry. They have a different process for their milk. They use a different They, they do, yeah. And that's the, uh, the, the, that's the key difference, absolutely. So unsurprisingly, um, uh, most people, when it's 15 cents a wanton, most people go for the lint chocolate, the luxury lint chocolate. It should normally be a dollar. And it's the same to, it's the same ratio when they add a cent. So it's 16 and two or 17 and three. But it's interesting what happens when they knock a cent off. Suddenly, 
most of the demand goes to the, the Hershey's Kiss. It might taste like sick, but it's free sick. Free does something weird to our ability to make these price comparisons. Now, I do want to be clear here. I'm not talking about giving away the core thing that you do for free. What I'm talking about is there'll be a whole load of ancillary things that you can do uh, and add on for free that just make the comparison between you and somebody else harder. And I'll come back to that in a moment. There are a number of ways in which free applies. So, for example, um, uh, one is this. You'll have all seen this kind of loyalty card. Now, you go into a coffee shop, they say, oh, would you like to participate in our loyalty scheme? And you say, oh, yeah, OK, yeah, I don't mind. And you, they serve you the coffee and then they give you a tick in the box or a bean or whatever it might be. So a group of researchers wondered, what would happen if we actually printed a card with 12 boxes on it? And we got the server to say, Shh, don't tell anybody. I'll give you the first two for free to get you started and serve you the coffee and here's the, here's the one that uh, you've just ordered. There's an 80% improvement in participation in the loyalty scheme. 80% more people participate, participate. And those that do complete the card faster. They are more engaged with the brand and they use more of it. Now, if we were, if we were all computers, there's nine boxes either way. But because we're human, we look at it and, oh, we're only 10% of the way there. This is going to take forever. Well, in the second example, wow, we're a quarter of the way through already. This is going to be easy. We've given away something that's free and, and has a value attached to it, but it's also another heuristic called the illusion of progress. The more progress it feels like we're making, the more motivated we are to make further progress. But this is giving away something for free that has a perceived value to the customer costs you nothing. So how do you use this? Well, uh, as I say, you don't apply free to the core thing that you do. But let's say the uh, this bathroom and tile centre, they've got, uh, they're putting a quotation in for somebody for their luxury bath, toilet shower and basin, and it's all fit and installed. But our service includes, we'll do a free design service, and you get a free interactive plan and a free project management guide for, you know, because if, if, if things aren't done on time, you'll probably blame us. We're going to throw in a kitchen sink and an arm and a leg and our firstborn child. You can find things that are of low cost to you, but a high perceived value to the customer that you can provide for free. But also, it's worth stopping and just considering the vast majority of the people in the audiences, when I talk to them, look at each other and say, you know, we're actually giving, we're, we're doing this, we're doing this, we're doing this, and it's all included, and we've just stopped telling people about it. We're not bringing it to their attention, and importantly, we're not bringing it to their attention at the point in which they are making the pricing decision. It's not there on the quotation or whatever. So my little friend is actually £40, but you do get free delivery, gift wrapping, name certificate, a fur coat, and an entry into a prize for all. The final pricing concept is this one. This is something called arbitrary precision. Now, it turns out that when we encounter a number, if that number is precise, it feels smaller than a round number would. So, for example, 325,000. 425 feels smaller than 325,000 when those numbers are tested on different people. Because we're not computers, you know, we are humans. Well, somehow we've got to try and imagine, assess what the, what's the magnitude of this number? What's the size or the scale of it? Obviously, 325,425 is the bigger number. It's 425 bigger. But when people are tested with those numbers in isolation, 325,425 feels smaller than 325,000. Precise numbers just feel smaller than round numbers. The reason why there's a picture of a house here is 27,000 house sales in Florida were analysed where the original asking price was known and the final price that was paid was known. And it turns out that the more precise the initial asking price, the fewer zeros there are in the initial asking price, 
the closer the final price is, the less negotiation takes place. And you can kind of see why, you know, a uh, precise number feels like there's some science behind it. In fact, um, let me just uh, talk to you directly. It feels, let's say uh, you're all web developers and I come to you and I say, here's a specification. I want you to design a website for me. A lot of agencies, they're, they're like, you know, when they price something, it's 75 pounds an hour for somebody's time. Or, you know, or it'll take about 10 hours. You, you end up getting quoted something quite precise. You know, let's say it's 5,000 pounds. We can do it for you. Well, when you say 5,000 pounds to me, that feels like you've just gone, hmm, let's call it 5,000. You're inviting me to go, hmm, I'll call it three. If you can make up a number, I can make up a number. Let's have a chat, shall we? There's another subtle thing going on here. When you say 5,000, you are hinting that negotiation will take place in thousands and maybe 500s. If instead you say, oh, it's 5,180, well, that feels like there's a reason for it now. There's some science behind it. Plus, you're hinting that negotiation will take place in hundreds and tens. And we might say, oh, let, let's, why don't we call it 5,000 between friends? And you say, yeah, OK, why not? Yeah. But that's fine. That's the number that you were going to charge in the first place anyway. So precise numbers you know, uh, are negotiated less. But let's say you're, you're talking to a professional uh, buyer, you know, and you, you quote whatever it is, and, and the buyer goes, that's a, I, I think professional buyers, when, when they wake up in the morning, they walk into the bathroom, and they're, they're, there's the mirror there. Before they even brush their teeth, they look in the mirror and they go, and they practice the face and sound. So, so you put a quote to a buyer and they get a, that's expensive. You couldn't sharpen your pencil, could you? Well, most people then will say, oh, I can knock 10% off. Well, if you can knock 10% off, why can't you knock 11, 12, 13, 14, 15? You clearly just made a number up and you're inviting them to say, well, I was really hoping for 20%. Why don't, why don't sorry, 30%. Why don't we call it 20? If instead you do this, you say, hang on a second. I could knock 3.9% off. Well, now it looks like there's a reason for it. If you say 10, again, you're hinting that negoti negotiation will take place in 10s and 5s. If you say 3.9%, oh, you're hinting that negotiation will take place in ones and point ones. And each of these things helps you in terms of achieving the best possible final price. And this is not just in th uh, consumer areas. Um, on the slides, and you will get a copy of the slides afterwards, uh, if I'm quoting any research, I'll put, uh, I'll put the reference on the, um, uh, on the slide. The middle reference there is Harvard Business Review. Harvard Business Review published an analysis of mergers and acquisitions, buying and selling businesses, and exactly the same behavior as the houses, buying and selling houses was observed. The more precise the initial asking price for the business, the closer the final price was that was paid. Because we are all human, we're all driven by these emotional non-objective factors, and we like to think that we are hugely logical, and in reality, we're not. We use our gut feel and our instinct, a lot more than we uh, we consider. So how might you use this? Well, uh, as I say, uh, agencies you know, typically will charge you know, quite round numbers for things. Yeah, we can do this rebrand for you. It's 9,000 pounds, but why, why is it 9,130? And my little friend is actually 58 pounds and 32 pence, but you do get free delivery. They're the three pricing concepts. Before I finish, I just want to talk about testing, because before you do anything, you should test it as much as it is possible to do so. I spent nine months as the interim managing director for this business. The, the owner of the business was going through chemotherapy. And uh, uh, so I was, um, uh, I was keeping the business going, uh, trying to grow the, uh, the sales. So it's gone through a bit of a slump and prepare the business for sale. The, um, the owner had a 
an opinion about 99 pence pricing. Uh, she said, look, everybody knows that 7.99 is really eight pounds. We should, we're just gonna treat our customers like adults, we'll call it eight. I wanted to do a test and I got her permission to, to do one on what marketers call charm pricing, you know, the, that 99 pence. Um, psychologists call this left digit bias. So she said, okay, yeah, do a test. I found every product that was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine pounds, or ended in a zero, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, et cetera. I divided them into two groups. One group I knocked one penny off, and then I just let them go, uh, run for three months. I used the control group to remove any seasonality for the three months of the test compared to the three months before the test. And what happened was the group that I knocked the penny off sales increased by 36% in the three months after I did that compared to the three months before, sales volume, and the amount of money that we made went up by 18%. And the reason the two numbers aren't identical is because the mix of products varies, of course. But just knocking one penny off generated that level of sales increase. So you can imagine the, the day after the analysis, every single product had a penny knocked off. But this is the importance of testing. Now, I can tell you what's a typical thing, but I can't guarantee it because every market is different. Uh, the way you execute a price communication is different. You've got to test these things, figure out what works, do more of it, and try and improve on it. Now, uh, if you, these are just three pricing concepts. There are a lot more if you want to read more about this. I do have a book, it's in both uh, uh, Kindle and print version on Amazon, uh, £5.88, Ta-da! why wouldn't it be? <laughs> now, I started off by asking you, what's the most expensive liquid in a typical home? And I said it was printering in an average home. There, there are more expensive things, some perfumes are expensive, but you'll find those in the Beckham's home, not in an average home. So in an average home, it's this. What would you say is the most expensive liquid in the whole world if to buy a litre of it? And I'll say right now, at room temperature, because the number of people that say, oh, liquid gold or liquid platinum or even liquid diamond. Well, I'm sorry, A, it doesn't liquefy, and B, if you could liquefy it, it wouldn't be a diamond anymore. You know, <laughs> it'd just be carbon. Um, so this is at room temperature. What do you think is the most expensive liquid in the world? So either come off mute and uh, tell me or, or type something into um, chat. Mer mercury, David? Mercury is pretty expensive, but uh, if it was as expensive as this, you'd never afford the <laughs> thermometer again. Water, yeah. Bottled water is about, I don't know, 10,000 times or 100,000 times more expensive than tap. But, um, but per litre, yeah, yeah, it's still only a pound or two for a bottle of water. Coffee? Um, Co uh, coffee's a granule, but but yeah, when you make a cup of coffee, Starbucks is expensive, but no, not a litre of it. I'll the liver you. oil of some of some animal, as uh, are some fish. It, no, but you're kind of getting it. It, it is a product of um, of something. Somebody said blood. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you want my blood, yes, <laughs> it would be expensive. I'll show you. The most expensive thing in the world is this. To be accurate, <laughs> it's not the Botox injection, it's the raw material that goes into it, the botulinum toxin. So if you were to buy a litre of botulinum toxin all in one go, it might be as expensive as Terry's sweat and tears. <laughs> but if you were to buy a litre, of botulinum toxin all in one go. What do you think it would cost? How much would that cost? A litre. Uh, a litre of bot pure botulinum toxin in one go. What would that cost? £100,000. How much, sorry? 100000 100000 Yeah, that's not bad. Any other takers? 38127 <laughs> Abby, precision. I like it. That's wonderful. <laughs> $12,000, <laughs> I'll show you. 
a litre of botulinum toxin, if you buy it all in one go, would actually cost, actually no, it would be more. Actually no, it would be more. It would be 20 billion pounds. Or cool. when I last checked the exchange rate, it will be 19 billion, 349 million, 500,000 pounds, just to be precise. And if that, and the reason is that this is by far and away the most toxic substance known to man. Um, it costs hundreds of dollars per millionth of a gram. And if you ever have a Botox injection, it's almost pure water. But if that doesn't demonstrate that there's no absolute price for anything, then I don't know what does. I hope that's been useful. And I hope those three concepts are things that you can take away and apply. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, David. That was uh, wonderful. Thank you. Um, any questions for David um, whilst we got him? Go on, Dave. Right. Hopefully my signal's uh, good enough. So I absolutely get all the science behind all of this, but I've got two questions, David, around the pricing. So my uh, so I am a consultancy and I'm not, my prices are normally in the four figure bracket, right? So obviously pricing by pence would be ridiculous. I would say mm -hmm. by pound would still be ridiculous or, or not. Am I, should I be doing it to kind of to 50? No, I, I, as a buy into this piece. I, I'm 100% with you, and I do exactly the same. I leave the final digit as a zero for four figure uh, quotations because going down to the, unless there's a reason for it, but even if there's a reason for it, the consultancy, there's a danger that seem insulting. No, uh, that, that you're, you're penny pinching down to the last halfpenny for something like uh, consulting. Um, so, uh, so no, I, 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 I avoid 50s. There's no reason why it should be a multiple of uh, 25 or 50 uh, at, at the end. So, uh, but I do have a zero. So, uh, I, so the number might be 1840, for example, you know, which is not a multiple of 25 or 50. Gary, yeah, okay. that makes sense. I don't know. Oh. oh, just losing you there, Dave. Dave, can you try again? I think we lost him. Okay, so uh, Graham, I think you you got your hand up. Yeah, um, I um, would provide some accountancy services and around providing three three prices, like a bronze, silver, gold, or whatever you want to type yeah. call it. I know I noticed in your examples you did have sometimes three prices. What, what do you feel on that? Because a lot of people would say if you give people three prices, they tend to pick the middle one. Um, just yep. again, psychological thing because they don't want to be too measly to pick the lowest, and they feel the top one's too expensive. But you know, what's, what's no, your thoughts absolutely on that? Right, and um, I, and most people do. Um, so the uh, the way that works is um, uh, it's another heuristic called the Goldilocks heuristic. If we're presented with three choices, the middle one feels the safest. Um, but the way that I approach the free pricing bit is you start with the thing that the customer uh, has asked for. And what you do is you try and find an added value option and another added value option. You're not starting, you're not starting in the middle, finding a lower and a, a higher and a lower. You're not starting at the top and discounting and discounting. So if you're starting with the thing that customers ask you to quote for and you're finding an added value and an added value, if they do go for the middle, then you still, you know, you, you, that's an improvement on where you would have been beforehand. And that's how I, if I'm quoting for something, you know, I'll say, yeah, okay, here, here's the range of different things. But there's, for example, um, sometimes people will ask me to come along and just do a, a morning session um, or, or no, a, a seminar for the sales team, you know, which might be an hour. But I'll usually quote for the half day and the full day as well. And the way that I, I will put it in the document is, um, no problem, here's the quote. I just want to say often, the, you know, when, when we start with this, um, uh, customers, uh, typic, you know, some customers end up wanting to do a little bit more, a little bit more. I'll just let you know in advance, if you do end up wanting the half day or the full day, this is what they might cost. You know, so I'm simply putting the information in front of them. Here's the thing that you've quoted for, but it means that those three options are there and sometimes they do come back and they say 
actually, you know, when we think about it, there is quite a lot more value in the half day because you'll run the workshop, you'll embed all the learning, we'll figure out how we're actually going to apply it within the organisation. You can facilitate all of that. Yeah, let's go for that one, please. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I use a pricing tool called Go Proposal. It's designed specifically for accountants. And it's quite good that way because you can actually sort of um, be more um, analytical about the prices. You can price specific items by numbers of employees or numbers of transactions and so forth. And then also has a section where you might want to consider. So in the conversation, they might say, well, I don't want to do forecast and a budget, but you can say, well, you might want to consider that and this is what the cost will be type thing. So it gives them that option to, to see so they can select it as a menu option if that makes sense. Yeah, very good. Okay. So Julian. Um, I think we've got Julian, Neil, then Gary, please. Yeah. Hey, David, that was really, really great. Um, so Feather, uh, the company that I run, is a friendship app for making more meaningful connections. And we are currently... Uh, I beg your pardon, Julian. So, say that again. The company is a... Friendship app for making more meaningful connections. So using okay, right, yeah. um, artificial intelligence to connect members and... We're working with quite a few partners now of, of varying sizes to kind of basically help them build community better. And these companies vary from companies worth six billion pounds to organizations of just 5,000 um, yeah, NGOs, etc. We're super new to this pricing game and I'm having conversations with um, one of these companies late today about how much we're going to be charging them. To be completely honest with you, I, don't, I really don't know where to start. And we've actually, so uh, currently reading Never, well, I've just finished reading Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss about trying to unearth as much information from the company as possible to really start to understand where, where it's priced. But some tips would be, yeah, yeah only received. Well, I, I Never Split the Difference is a good starting point. Uh, I, I agree. And fundamentally, the, this comes back to that diagram I showed you about the pricing. The, the, this is about the, the analysis bit. Um, it's understanding the value that you're going to be delivering. You know, uh, and value is partly the financial side, but there are non-financial elements to value as well. So for example, if, uh, if what you're going to do is going to make the particular individual that you're negotiating with look really good and is likely to get them promoted to the board of the company. That's a value, you know. It's a you can't put a dollar sign against it, but that's a value uh, uh, too. So you want to be trying to work out what are the financial value elements, what are the non-financial. Are we going to make this guy look like a superstar inside the organisation? Yeah. Um, I then personally, I try and price on the value that I am going to deliver. Uh, the uh, one aspect of that is a consequence of uh, a consequence of that is you, you say that you're, you're talking to companies of different sizes it means that i typically charge more the bigger the company and it's not simply the bigger companies can afford more the principle behind everything i do is it's about the value and if i add one percent to a billion dollar company that a that's a <laughs> that's a very meaty bottom yeah that's what, what 10 million uh pounds on the bottom line uh, if i had one percent to a one million pound company that's ten thousand pounds on the bottom line so the level of value that i'm going to deliver to the company also influences how much the, uh, i'm going to charge them just as kind of principles because yeah i do we can spend a day on this as principles uh, as a starting point does that help Yeah, okay. Yeah, thanks so much, Jason. Neil, I think, was yeah. next. Yeah. Um, I think Gary might have been before me, but I'll, I'll be happy to, to dive in. Um, uh, it's really interesting. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, David. Um, question really is, is probably similar to the conversation just had around that sort of value discount trade off and sort of, I guess, like the DFS syndrome is, you know, when you see companies and pricing, there's always quite a considerable percentage discount against the product. It makes you question why was that price? You know, what is that original price even real? Um, yeah. Why is there a permanent discount? So just sort of your advice on maybe that stage process of where do you feel is like maybe a sweet spot of a percentage discount that you should maybe not go beyond? I, oh gosh, is there a percentage? 
I, I've never given that any thought. I'll be absolutely honest with you. The um, uh, I'm I'm not against discounts. But there are, I've got a couple of observations. One is I've analysed the discount processes in in a lot of companies now, and um, and the, there's quite a wide variation. But on average, for uh, you take all the companies together. For every 1% of discount, you need to increase your sales by 3% on average. I, and I've, I've got a simple model. I can plug four numbers into it and tell you what, what it is for your company. So if you want to contact me separately, I'll happily do that with you. you know, I can tell you what that sensitivity is. But there's a lot of people who will give 10% oh, give away without realizing they've, got, they've now got to increase their sales by 30% just to stand still. Yeah. They're not making any more money. They're working 30% harder yeah. and they're only standing still. So that's, that's one thing. The other thing is about discounting too often. I, I, <laughs> I like chocolate. Hang on. <laughs> this, <laughs> this is my... <laughs> Jesus. That's my... <laughs> that's not everything. <laughs> I really like chocolate. And one of my favorites is uh, there's a Galaxy um, Caramel bar. Um, it is on, uh, it's on sale often, it's normally £1.50, and it's often enough £1 that I, I, I have been trained to resist buying it for £1.50. I can afford the extra 50 pence. Mm. It, you know, it, it, it's still good value. I still thoroughly enjoy it, but it is so often special price one pound in the uh, the supermarkets that now i will not buy it for one pound fifty so the danger you've got to be really careful with discounting and sales if you if it becomes well, you mentioned dfs you know it's like yeah. dfs why would anybody ever buy anything at full price at dfs you'd wait for the sale you know there's one coming you know so the, the there's two observations um so the first, the first one is the one that is probably the most helpful in terms of the answer to your question, because it's not that there's a sweet spot, but there's, you, you've got to do the math to make sure that the discount actually is going to make any difference to you. Yeah. you know, are you going to be better off at the end of it? So, Gary? 